Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you tonight. Um, I'd like to start this talk with a little bit of history, if I may. And I'd like to go back about a hundred odd years to when the Panama Canal was being built. And the first attempt at this was actually by a French team. Um, monumental task. And as they were going through the construction of the Panama Canal, a lot of the workers were going down with fevers. These were actually the other fevers from malaria. Um, and a lot of people were dying. And they didn't really know what the cause was. And various ideas were postulated. One, in fact, was that these fevers were being passed by uh, ants. And one of the remedies for the ants in stopping the transmission of disease was for people to sleep in beds, and for those beds to stand in saucers of water and stop the ants crawling across, coming across the water up the bed and biting the people. And of course, filling a saucer full of water is actually the most ideal mosquito green side to get. <laughs> so they had some of the idea. Now over time, what's happened is that our knowledge of disease and vectors has improved tremendously. But our ways of controlling those vectors really hasn't. And just to complete the story on Panama Canal, um, after about eight years of attempt, that first attempt was by the French, um, about 20,000 people had died um, from fevers largely. And the attempt collapsed. And a few years later, it was actually a British scientist, Robert Ross, who established that malaria was spread by mosquitoes. And that enabled uh, an American team to come in and actually concentrate on mosquito control and hence construct the canal. But I'm not going to talk about yellow fever so much. I'd like to concentrate first on something called dengue fever. Now, dengue fever would have been pretty much unknown at that time. Dengue fever is a very unpleasant <coughs> disease. Um, it can be, it can manifest itself as a virus spread only by the bite of an infected mosquito, largely only by one mosquito. There are some others that will transmit, but they're not very effective. So it's transmitted by a mosquito, and the way it's transmitted is a mosquito will bite an infected person then they will bite another one, and then they'll bite another one, and so the virus will move across people. Um, the symptoms of dengue fever can be anything really from asymptomatic to a mild flu, to feeling as if your bones are breaking, and that's actually the nickname of this disease, is break bone fever. And in the severe forms, you can get hemorrhagic fever and shock syndrome, um, and you can get fatalities. It's not renowned as malaria is for fatalities, and obviously the children and, and the older age groups are the most susceptible. Now it does have an interesting feature because although we talk about the dengue virus, there's not actually one virus, there are four. And if you're bitten by a mosquito carrying one of the four viruses, uh, you'll probably get sick. If you're a fit, healthy adult, you'll recover, and you'll develop antibodies against that form of dengue. But that very four, that, those very antibodies that actually protect you against reinfection of that one type will actually enhance your susceptibility to the other three types. So you really don't want to get dengue, and you certainly don't want to get it twice. <coughs> and that's really why dengue is such a nightmare for health officials, because what tends to happen is that you have the mosquito in the area, one of those virus types comes <coughs> in, people get ill, they develop immunity, but then when the next time comes in, you get more cases and more severe symptoms. So this is now, dengue is now the world's most um, prevalent mosquito-borne virus. And if you consider the claim I made at the beginning, which is we're not very good at controlling mosquitoes, if you take the number of mosquito-borne diseases, the number of cases every year, actually the number of mosquito-borne diseases and cases infections is going up, not down. Take malaria, if you take dengue, we're actually increasing the number of overall cases. And that's happening really because we're not able to control the mosquito. And what we're doing, and we're being, we're being very nice to this actually, we're concentrating humans, which it will use for its feed, for biting, um, into nice big cities. 
So we're putting all the all of the blood stock, if you like, in one place in readily accessible um, buckets. Um, and we're not controlling it, and hence the disease is going out of control. And so this is a map. Now the principal mosquito that spreads dengue is something called Aedes aegypti, and it's um, a mosquito that actually came, like it sounds, out of uh, North Africa. So it's actually spread from North Africa, and over time it has spread around the world, and as it's spread around the world, it takes dengue with it. And you should see here uh, the map of dengue following the map of um, Egypti. Now some people would think that the mosquito flies around the world. In fact, they only fly about 200 yards in their lifetime. Um, but even still, people have a perception that they fly 200 yards, the next generation will fly a bit further and further and further and they spread around the world. But actually they're not very good at flight, but they're very good at hitchhiking. These are superb hitchhikers. And we will move mosquitoes around the world. We will move them in our planes, we'll move them in our cars, trucks, aeroplanes. Um, car tires are often associated with this mosquito as the way in which we spread mosquitoes around the world. It's not the only way. But if you take a car tire and you put some water in it, we all know how difficult it is to get water out of a car tire. So you've created a lovely breeding site for a mosquito. You move the second hand cut car tires around the world and actually you're moving mosquitoes around the world. And hence the spread of this mosquito. Now, on this map you see the mosquito in brown, how it's spread around the world, and then the dengue cases in yellow. And you think, why are there some places where this virus hasn't established? <clears throat> Partly geography, uh, this mosquito um, breeds in water, so where you have an absence of water, where you have desert, you're not going to find this mosquito. You're only going to find this mosquito in urban environments where there are lots of humans, where you have seasonal rainfall. But in other cases, it's just a matter of time, actually. Um, so even since this map, we've now got quite a few cases in Argentina. And as time progresses, the mosquito actually gets into more and more um, geographies and it takes the virus with it. A nice little example of that was um, <coughs> A nice little example, an unpleasant example. It was two years ago, actually, in Madeira. Now, in 2005, uh, in Madeira, they noticed for the first time ever that they had the Aedes aegypti. They found it in their mosquito uh, surveys. And they'd never had it before. And then in 2012, about this time of year, actually, September, they had their first cases of mosquito dengue fever. So only sort of seven years after they first found the mosquito, they first found, first found the case of dengue. very first question you ask anyone who has dengue is, have you been travelling? And if they haven't, you know you've got a problem, you've got medical transmission. Um, by about December, there was about 2,000 cases of dengue in Madeira. So very, very rapid transmission. Um, and that tends to be the pattern, especially with this mosquito, because this mosquito really doesn't like biting anything else, it just loves humans. And we're not just worried about um, dengue, there's also other diseases coming through. Um, there's something called chikungunya, which um, I don't know how many people have heard of chikungunya. It means literally bent over, and again it gives you that feeling of um, your, all of your bones being sort of on fire, and it's a <coughs> of pain. Um, chikungunya first came into the Caribbean area in December last year. First time, not seen before that. The mosquito that transmits it is this one, Aedes aegypti. But actually the virus hadn't been seen in the Caribbean before. By about um, May or June, the Centre for Disease Control was reporting about 300,000 cases. And by now, it's, I've seen different reports recently of about 740,000 cases up to a million cases. So a really huge, rapid progression of the disease. <coughs> and with both Tengli and Chikungunya, there is no medication, uh, there's no uh, vaccine, there's no medication, so the only way to control it is actually to control the mosquito that spreads the disease. There are vaccines in development, um, that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is that it work very well. Um, so the most advanced uh, dengue vaccine is being produced by Sanofi Pasteur, 
um, it seems to have reasonably good control of two, if not three, of the four types, and really very poor control of the fourth one. Um, no, I have no doubt at all it's going to be a blockbuster drug, I mean a vaccine. Um, any of us in this room, if we are travelling to a dangerous country and we're asked to pay, I don't know, $60 for a vaccine with a 50% chance of it working, I think we'd all do it. But I don't think it's a reasonable solution for a large population in a developing country. So we still need vector control tools. We need to control this much detail. And here she is, this is the culprit. Now mosquitoes, um, it's only the female that bites you. The male doesn't bite you, can't bite you. The only reason the male will hover around you and get in your way is because it knows that that's where the females are going to be. Um, the best way to avoid being bitten, to be honest, is quite a lot of deep, long sleeve shirts and to stand next door to someone who's actually more attractive to mosquitoes than you are. <laughs> I've always gone for that theory, um, and it seems to work very well. But really, we don't really have very good defences. Um, and this mosquito, she will bite as your mate, she will bite, um, she will lay eggs. She will lay between, um, or about up to 100 eggs at a time, 40, 50, 60. And in, in a lifetime, she'll lay about 500 eggs, um, if she survives long enough. They will lay their eggs in um, clear water. So if you took something like this glass, this would be a perfect mosquito breeding site. So what will happen is the mosquito will come along and lay their eggs on the um, inside surface here. What happens in nature is the mosquito is looking for um, an environment for the eggs to survive. And so if it's raining, and this is, let's say, it's a tree hole or, or a flower pot or some surface, some, some container, as the rains come, the water will rise, the eggs will then sink down, and then that's a signal for them to hatch. It's the drop in the oxygen that will actually give them a, a hatching signal. And hopefully for the mosquito, there's enough detritus and, and, and food sources in there. Um, but that's a very nice uh, breeding site for a mosquito. And there's plenty of these around town. Empty coke cans, puddles, block gutters, swimming pools, bird baths, um, you know. You've only got to walk around an urban environment after the rain and just look and see how many, how much standing water there is and think every single one of those is a breeding site. So it's a, a monster challenge. Very well adapted to the urban environment, this mosquito. And this, I have to say, it, at the moment, is the best that modern science has to offer. Um, and I'd like to put this in context, actually, by stepping sideways into agriculture. In agriculture, insecticides have been fantastically valuable. And if you think about a field in agriculture, and I'll paint it to a children's picture of the field for you, big square field, you can go over it with a tractor, a boom sprayer, or an aerial sprayer, and you can actually cover that area fairly, fairly well. You have access to the whole area in order to control your insects with your insecticide. And chemicals in agriculture have been fantastically beneficial in terms of production. <laughs> when you come into the urban environment, though, it's a major, major challenge. We're in Belgrave Square. Now, let's assume each of you here, just put yourself in this position, let's assume um, London is somewhere in a sort of tropical or subtropical area. There'll be mosquitoes all over town. So let's assume you're trying to control this mosquito, trying to get rid of it, in the area around Belgrave Square. Well, at least 50% of the mosquitoes will be in people's houses, in these buildings. You're going to have to get access to every single house in order to use a chemical. And you're not just going to have to get access once, you're going to get, have to get access continually in order to treat those houses. So from a point of view of a public health authority, no matter how good your product is, the lack of access actually to private property is the single biggest problem you've got in terms of controlling these mosquitoes. And you've got to get all of the houses. You can't just get nine out of ten. You've got to get a lot. Um, otherwise, you're just going to have a breeding mosquito population. And it's a huge challenge. And that's why I purposely picked this picture here, because this is actually <coughs> obviously in the schoolroom. Um, and someone is fogging, they've forgotten to put their uh, mask on, of course, which is very, very common. 
Um, but you are going to have to get into people's houses. And recently I was in, I was in Brazil, um, and in an area we're looking to carry out a project. All of the houses have this um, wrought iron gating, behind that are the people's cars, behind that are their houses. They're all fortresses because of the theft problem. We had some very interesting, did some very interesting work in Malaysia in terms of public engagement. What do you do when you see a man fogging in the street? Well, I close my windows and doors. I try and keep the chemical out because I don't like it. Well, that's a very human reaction. What do you do if the man with the chemical wants to come into your house and fog in your kid's bedroom? You keep the door closed, you're not in. So it's a really impossible task. Um, added to that, you have the issue of insecticide resistance. So actually, the most modern chemical we're using at the moment, which is terrific in agriculture, is the pyrethroid class, introduced in the early 70s. That's still the most, the newest, if I use that, but the newest chemical in the public health environment. So it's been there for over 50 years. The amount of insecticide resistance is absolutely huge. So there's a immense challenge here. Um, and again, if you talk to the, um, the public health uh, companies, those selling insecticides into, into towns, they don't actually see their products as ones which are designed to kill mosquitoes in a large area. It's all about spot treatment. It's about treating hotels in the morning so people go to the pool. It's about treating around football stadiums so actually when people come together, you've, you've, you've reduced the threat. But no one has got any solution to actually reducing the mosquito level down to a point at which you can actually prevent uh, disease. So, so far I've been fairly depressing. I'm hoping to cheer you up in a minute. <laughs> um, okay, so here's our solution. Um, our solution is to relies on genetic engineering. Now, I said that only the females bite you, and that's true. Males are, don't bite you, they can't, but they're very good at doing something. They're very good at finding females. And this is not particular to mosquitoes, this happens across a number of different species. <laughs> but a male will always find a female. It is biologically programmed from the moment um, it emerges to go and find a female. So what we've done in Oxitec is we've actually genetically engineered this particular species, Aedes aegypti, to carry a lethal gene. So what happens, and this is the theory, and we'll look at the practice in a minute. So what happens is uh, these mosquitoes, the males, they go out, they find the female, and that female, instead of having a hundred eggs, which are all going to emerge into mosquitoes, she'll have a hundred eggs, let's say, and they'll die. And they'll die somewhere between the larval stage and, the, and being a functioning adult. But they die. There's another thing we've done. So we've used effectively two genes at the same time, which are tied to each other in fact. So one is this lethal gene, which stops the offspring from surviving, and the other is a fluorescent protein. So actually, when you look at the larvae under a light, um, what you see is a red colour. And I'll come to that in a second, because it's actually rather a useful tool. So these males, they go out, they mate with females, the offspring die. It's actually quite straightforward, in theory. So, what's the advantage of doing this? Well, one is efficacy. These males are biologically tuned to go and find females. If there are females in a house, the male doesn't have to knock on the door, ask for permission to come in, he's just going to go in. He's going to find the female. We only release males. That's an advantage, because females bite. And even though they wouldn't have dengue, we don't want to produce females that bite. Um, there, there is this concept of biological targeting, and it's a species-specific approach. Now, again, if you are in an urban environment and you're using a large amount of chemical to attack and try and find disease mos uh, mosquitoes, spreading mosquitoes, you're also actually going to impact upon other forms of wildlife. Um, this may or may not be an issue, but mosquitoes will only make for their own species and you're only actually targeting the one species that you're trying to target here. You're not touching anything else. The um, protein that's produced that actually ties up the cell machinery that actually leads to death is not toxic or allergenic. Um, 
It's not present in the saliva, uh, so if you're bitten, it doesn't come into your, into your uh, bloodstream. Um, so it's totally innocuous from that point of view. So actually, this is a, a reproduction blockage in the, in the mosquito that doesn't infect, affect other species. And when, if you do feeding studies, um, or if you're looking at ants or spiders, things that eat these mosquitoes, there's no difference between eating a genetically engineered one and a normal one. You get the same amount of fat, the same amount of protein. And then you have this heritable visible marker. And these are actually uh, fruit flies here on the, in, in the picture, not mosquitoes. But you can see it's quite a marked colour. You can see the wild type, hopefully, next to the genetically engineered one. In normal light, they're indistinguishable. If you look at them with a filter, then you can see one is coloured and one is not. And that's very important, actually, because let's assume we're doing this in agriculture, which I'll come back to, and you're releasing a whole load of um, insects, fruit flies. How does the farmer know the difference between the pest and the one that's being sent out to control the pest? And the answer is you can identify them by colour. But perhaps the most important thing here is this is self-limiting in the environment. What you're actually doing is um, something akin, um, and I know from a scientific point of view it's not strictly correct, but this is birth control for insects. It's self-limiting. Every male you're going to put out into the environment is going to die in a few days. Its offspring are going to die. It is not going to persist. So it's self-limiting. End of story. So really this is an intervention you can use you can put out there, and in a few days it's gone. So, the theory. How is this going to work in practice? Well, the theory goes as follows. You have a town. In that town you have lots of houses. You know these mosquitoes actually don't fly very far, so you are going to take a truck, and you're going to release the mosquitoes. Um, and I'll show you this in a minute. You know that your males are only going to travel about 200 yards, so your truck is going to move around town and cover the area you design. Now you might think that's a big challenge, and actually to be fair, I thought that was an enormous challenge. Um, it's actually not too bad, um, so we can cover a very large area of town really quite quickly by having um, someone in a van going around and we know where to release. We used to do it in a, in a way that was quite sort of scientific, now we just release on street corners, so it's a very simple uh, mechanism. So you release, and the objective is to release enough males so you outnumber the wild males. The females can't tell the difference. There is no distinguishing feature where the female can tell a wild one from a, a genetically engineered one. So you've got to outnumber the males, the wild ones, so the females are more likely to make laws and then you'll drive that population down. But it's important to get a good distribution because if you imagine your van driver goes on the same circuit every day, and he's, instead of stopping off, instead of releasing mosquitoes in one area, he stops off for a cup of coffee, he's not going to treat that area. And that's where this marker comes in, because you can actually collect little samples around town, you can see the <coughs> colour. You can see that, for example, when you first start releasing, a couple of weeks after you're releasing, 20% of the larvae that you find back will have the red colour. After a few more weeks, you'll find it's 50%. You'll see the total number down, and you can actually predict how quickly you want to bring that population down. If you don't treat an area, you won't see the red. If you're under-treating, you'll see less red than you want to. If you're over-treating, you'll see actually that you're wasting mosquitoes. So you have a calibration, so you can change the dose rate depending on the areas of town. Because the one thing you will know is the town's not a a uh, homogeneous area. It's very, very varied. So the marker is absolutely essential to this approach and very helpful. Now we need to outnumber these males. Um, so this is a chart of mosquito numbers, again theory. Rains come, mosquitoes come, disease comes. It's that order. So as the rains come, your mosquito numbers will spiral up very, very fast. Each of the life cycle of the mosquito is less than a month. Um, and so, if you imagine every single female producing 100, 200, 300 eggs, you get a massive explosion of, of numbers. Now, if we're, controlling, if we're trying to use our approach on the way up, we've got to outnumber the number of mosquitoes, so we're going to need a lot of mosquitoes. 
much easier to control them on the way down when you've got less, less there. Um, this didn't actually happen in our first trial. Our, first, our very first trial we did on, in, the, uh, in the outdoors was in Cayman, Cayman Island. And we were all set to release our mosquitoes in the dry season, get control. We were worried about starting too late because the rains would come. And then the volcano in Iceland blew up and no planes would fly and we couldn't get our mosquitoes out there. And we thought, oh dear, this is a problem. Our very first trial, and um, we've, we've got a huge issue here. Actually, we just had to produce more mosquitoes, which is fine, you can do that. Um, but in general, you want to control them when they're low and keep them low. So you need two phases here. You need a control phase when, when the numbers are coming down, and you want to keep them down. There's no point just doing this for a few months. You've actually got to maintain that level of control. And there are different options there. So if you take that image of the town, which will be more uh, densely populated in some areas and less in other areas. You've actually got different solutions here. Once you've driven that population right way down, you've effectively got rid of most of the mosquitoes. You've got varying options depending on what you're actually trying to achieve. One option is just to continue to release the low level. If you've got your mosquito numbers right, right the way down to trace levels, you actually don't need very many males to be released in order to maintain that control. Perfectly viable solution, um, and that works very well. So low level continuous release is one strategy. You may not wish to do that. What you might want to do, and this would particularly work, I think, particularly well if you're a, a Caribbean island or your town is surrounded by scrubland, effectively an island as well. You won't find mosquitoes in the scrub in the forest, not this variety anyway, the species. They'll, they'll only actually be where humans are. But if you are semi-isolated, then you really can think about, well, where are the mosquitoes coming back in? Is it the airport? Is it the marina? Let's just treat those, keep that treatment going. Um, and then I won't have to treat the other areas. And this is important because like any aspect of public policy, we're looking at cost-benefit. We're looking at how can we control these mosquitoes, protect the public, and do it in the most cost-effective way. The other idea you can do is you could say, all right, well, I'm prepared to tolerate some some disease, but I want to keep that low, and I'll establish a threshold. And actually, I'm just going to use this um, once I've got control in my high risk areas. Um, I was in Lahore recently, and they have quite the most fabulous monitoring system. Um, they've split Lahore into about 12, uh, sorry, 11 districts. In each district, they'll have about 400 uh, monitoring officers just looking for this mosquito. They go around the town. They, go, they inspect every single house. They try and estimate where their areas of high risk are, where they've got um, building sites, unoccupied houses, standing water, and the rubbish. They actually mark where their high risk areas are. The issue they have is they haven't got a decent control tool, but they've got a fairly good prediction system now, I think, as to where their hotspots are likely to be. This would work very well, control the hotspots. You're not going to get rid of the mosquito completely, but you are going to keep it down at levels which um, are acceptable. The other way you can do it is just monitor. Just monitor, and if it, it springs up, go and treat it. So you've got a number of different solutions. Um, now here's the challenge. The challenge, I think, is it's all very well coming up with a clever idea, but you've actually got to bring it through in public domain. You've got to bring it through in the public domain, you've got to get funding for it, you've got to make it operational, you've got to put in quality systems, um, you've got to build a whole supply chain, because like this jolly fish, which is jumping from one bowl to another, there's no one in that bowl, nothing exists. If I go to any town in Brazil and say, what's your budget for buying genetically engineered mosquitoes, I know exactly what the answer is. We don't do that. If we go to any country and we say, can we have your regulations for how we import and release genetically engineered mosquitoes? They say, sorry guys, never heard of them. Um, now some countries do have legislation and that can be adapted. Um, and I'll give you a nice little example. Very large country, west from here, crop will remain nameless, but it's uh, separated from the UK and Ireland by a large amount of water. We went to them and we said, You've also got this mosquito, we'd like to bring it in, we'd like to trial it. Um, people in, in, in your country would just trial it. 
can we bring it in? And they said, yes, you can. No problem at all. We have got all the regulation we need for genetically modified, modified animals. The mosquito is an animal, no problem at all. And our, our legislation says what you do is you tag each of the genetically modified animals in the year, and you've got no problem. Now, given that we actually want to release millions of them, this is a bit of a problem. Um, and so is location in the year. But, so you have an issue. You've got to actually change legislation, you've got to change regulation, you've got to adapt regulation. And for a small UK company, that's, that's been quite, a, quite an upheaval, actually, and quite a struggle. Um, the other thing is, if uh, I'm setting up a, we're setting up a production unit, and we wish to go and buy um, some cages, so we ring up the supplier and say, can we have a thousand of your best mosquito cages? <laughs> there you go, sorry. They didn't supply mosquito cages. Never heard of them. What's it look like? So actually, you've got to put all the building blocks in place. Um, if you have a new chemical, a new uh, chemical entity, you can go to a synthetic chemistry company and get it, get it made. But with, with this, if you're bringing in a truly new technology, it's quite an uphill battle. It's not a win or a complaint, it's just, it's, it's quite, it can be quite tricky. So let's look at the strain and look at how we're getting on. So how do you make a genetically engineered mosquito? Um, you form a, a, a cassette, it's the same system really in, as in GM crops. And you're actually going to take the eggs and you're going to inject them with a cassette of DNA. Uh, we'll do about a thousand or more injections in order to get um, three or four that will take up the DNA in, in the right place and look like they might be viable strain. You then develop those strains, make them homozygous for the, um, for the material, make sure they breed true, test them, make sure they breed enough, that they live as long as normal, they behave well, they fly the right distance, and they're in every way indistinguishable from a wild type, apart from carrying this genetic material. And that's a long process, actually. We first had our mosquito, uh, the one that we're using now, we had it back in 2002. So it's been about a 10 year process of internal trials. So once you've got your mosquito, and you've gone through quite a few years of trialing internally, you want to go into the big outdoors. And again, that's an issue because um, where do you go? You've got the whole world in front of you, and it looks like a very big place. Um, so right or wrong, and it's very difficult to know when you're first setting out, what we did was concentrate on four countries. The US. The reason for the US um, is because probably of all the countries in the world, it's seen to be the regulatory uh, gold standard. The level, the hurdles you need to jump through and the burden of proof and the amount of rigour in the regulatory system is generally seen to be at the top. Great, let's start there. But we'll learn a lot and then we should be able to go into a number of countries. So the US was one, Brazil was another. They have about a million cases of dengue at the moment each year and it's rising every year. Um, across the world it's rising phenomenally fast, 30 fold in 50 years, astonishing rate of growth. But Brazil, biggest single market, in biggest single area in terms of just daily cases. Um, India, they don't really know how many cases they have. Um, but they, if you talk to the government, they have about 30,000 cases of dengue a year. If you talk to the dengue experts, it's about 30 million. Um, I tend to believe the latter more than the former. But again, um, India, uh, we went for, and then Singapore, Malaysia, we actually started working in Malaysia. We've actually worked with a mix of partners. So in Malaysia, we worked directly with the Ministry of Health, in India with a company, in, U in, the, U in the US, directly with the mosquito control team in Florida, and in Brazil with a, uh, a company that's actually owned by the state. Enormous variety of, um, of partners and the way in which they operate. And that's been quite a learning process, I think, for us. So that's, that's what we were targeting. Um, and actually, I, this is a slide that I used about six years ago when we first decided let's go for those four. That's the reality now. So in the where you've got the green spots, that's where we've actually carried out outdoor, outdoor trials. Malaysia, yes. Brazil, yes. India and the US, we think we'll get those um, actually do outdoor releases either at the end of this year or next. The regulatory framework has um, been moving less fast, let's say but actually we're coming through. So I'm pretty confident we'll get into those two countries um, with trials in 2015. And then we add, we've added two, Cayman Islands, 
and interestingly enough, Panama. So the man in charge of the Panama program <coughs> when building the Panama Canal is a guy called William Gorkus. And he is um, credited, really, with solving the Mosquito problem. And there is an institute there uh, named after him, and that's who we're working with, so that's a nice little touch. And in Brazil, we've actually got um, a group to use these mosquitoes to release them into the environment. Um, so many people have told me this was impossible to do, you'd never manage it, you'll never get a genetically engineered uh, mosquito approved by anyone. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had on that front. But actually, yes, approval in Brazil, it's, it's happened now. Uh, and here is our uh, factory in Brazil. So this is actually the third mosquito factory in the world. The first one is in Abingdon, in Oxford. Very strange place to put a mosquito factory, but we live here, so that's where it is. Um, the second one is in the north of Brazil, and this one is now um, in a town called Campinas, just outside Sao Paulo. And that was officially opened the other day. And once you walk inside, this is what mosquito rearing looks like. This is a factory, we need to produce large numbers. So here we have cages. Each of these cages will have about 16,000 um, mosquitoes in. They'll produce about half a million eggs per week in each of the cages. And those eggs are then taken through larvae, pupae, adults. Some are retained to do the next generation, and some are um, used to generate the males that will then go into the field. Now there's a trick here, because at this point you may be thinking, I don't, there's a logic leap, because these ones are sterile in effect, they don't produce offspring, so how are we actually producing them? And the way we do this is, there is actually a third element to this, which is if you rear these mosquitoes in water, which contains an antidote, then the lethal gene that kills the offspring is suppressed. So it's a switch. So if you rear them in the laboratory with access to the antidote, they breed quite happily, they produce in large numbers, and they'll have a perfectly acceptable life cycle. Once you release them into the wild, they don't have that, then they're infertile again. And that's really important because producing a genetically engineered mosquito is a very expensive business. You can't do it over and over again. Um, and you've got to make this technology cheap and accessible. This is something that hopefully will be used in a number of countries um, over the next few years. If it's too expensive, people can't use it. We've got to make it accessible. Um, so, let's, so we've got our eggs, um, and from the eggs, um, the eggs will hatch out into larvae, which are the long, long things, pretty ones. And then those larvae, after a few days, will uh, turn into pupae, which are the things that look a little bit like shrimps, and then they will close into adults. Now we need to, we need batches of production. So we need to separate the larvae from the pupae, which we can do through a sort of sieve exercise. So we can actually separate those two things out. We can do that by shape. And then we need to separate the pupae. We only want, at this point, we've got both males and females. We only want males. But thankfully, males and females are very different sizes. So actually we can sieve sort them on size. So we can sieve sort on shape, and then we can sieve sort on size to give ourselves a male only population. Um, the larvae are reared up in these trays. The water in the trays is slightly yellow, and that's with the antidote in there. So they're all breeding quite happily. We've got about nine or 10,000 in those trays. And then from those trays, when they, after they've been sorted, we put them into these pots. So in each of these pots, You've got about a thousand. They, they go in as pupae, male pupae, freshly sorted. They're still in water. They pupate. They come out as male adults. They sit on the sides of the, of the little, very simple um, pots. They have sugar feed, give them some energy, there's a boost. Water gets drained away and they're ready to go. So they'll have a couple of days rest as adults and then they'll go out into the street. And this is release. Um, it's really as simple as that. You're driving a truck down the street, you have a large number of pots, you take the top of the pot off and you shake them out. And then they're gonna do the rest. They'll home in and find, find the females. And that's how it works. And as I say, it's meant to, it, is, it does look easy and it's meant to look easy because you've gotta make this technology accessible. Um, 
and you've got to make it accessible in all sorts of different environments. So the technology, if you like, is built in. So let's have a look at what the results would be, because nothing really matters until you get results. Um, now with mosquitoes, the primary measure, there are different ways of measuring mosquitoes in a town. The primary measure is something called an odor trap. So if you put a little black jar into the um, outside your house and you put some water in the bottom and you put a little wooden paddle, a bit like a lollipop stick, into, the, into there, the mosquito will be attracted to that as a breeding site because there's water. There's a nice paddle to sit on. Um, you get a good grip on the wood and they'll lay eggs and then you'll have larvae and then you can pick these up and you can see how many larvae you've got. And if you have larvae in one of those, then it's, you can score it one and if you don't, you score it nil and you have an odor trap index. Now, we start releasing the rainy season in this area, Manda Peru, which is a town in the north of Brazil. Um, quite affluent, actually, this one. Um, people would pick up trucks own houses, some of the houses separate from each other, with piped water. Um, uh, the rainy season here is at the, um, around the turn of the year through to about March. So again, what we're trying to do is release these mosquitoes as the numbers are coming down to make it easier for ourselves, but then you've got to keep control. And as you can see, as you go through the period of time, you're reducing the numbers down to pretty much zero. Now, being a good scientist, you've got to have control areas. You've got to have untreated areas which you can use as controls, and you've got to have historical data as well. So this is the untreated areas which are neighbouring, um, and literally neighbouring by about 200 yards. And what you're seeing here is a fairly constant mosquito population throughout the year. But when the rains come, you see that population spiralling up. Now what you don't see here, actually, is as we're, going, as we're going through and getting control, we're driving the green line down and getting those numbers down to zero, we're actually reducing the number of males because we don't need them. Because as the numbers come down, the margin by which you want to outnumber them comes down, you don't need so many. So from a practical point of view, you've then got spare capacity to then go and treat another area. Now that level of control is effectively 96% reduction in adults. And in fact, in all the trials I'll show you in a second, we've had a similar result. And again, you're bringing that population down and you're keeping it down into the next rainy season, um, when you would otherwise expect to see it spiral out of control. And then if you do that in a number of places, in a number of different trials, this is just a, uh, a summation really, which shows that in every single area, um, we've got over 90% control. And you cannot do that with any other product that we've seen so far. So it's a very high level of control, very effective. And, and this is a, these one, the, the areas we've done this is better varied. Some reasonably affluent, some extremely poor. Uh, Isabaraba, which is um, the second one across actually, a uh, rather foolish statement I made once to the Brazilians that said, why don't you give us your worst case for mosquitoes you can possibly give us? And they did. <laughs> And really terrible. Everybody with water butts um, outside their houses, which are not covered, they're using the same water butt for drinking, for cooking, and they're all full of mosquito larvae. It's just a swarm, the whole place. But 94% control in less than six months, which is um, very pleasing. So that was phase one. So it's actually happening now. Um, we're actually in the street, we're actually releasing these genetically engineered mosquitoes. So now is the time for phase two. Um, and let's go and jump our goldfish into another big bowl. So first thing is the technology itself can advance. So at the moment what we're doing is we're producing these uh, mosquitoes, we're separating males and females, and we're actually um, releasing them in a defined program. But wouldn't it be nice if uh, people could do their own release? Now the people can't release, they can't separate the males and the females themselves, that would be too much. But actually, if you could give them um, eggs, <coughs> then and, they, and those eggs only produce males, wouldn't that be nice? Um, and actually, that's what we've then got. That's product number two in effect. So actually, um, that will take some time, I think, to get through a regulatory system, because we're only just chunking our way through the first technology. 
But in effect, the vision here is, you live in Florida, you go to Walmart, you pick up a packet of mosquito eggs, you put them in your glass of water in your front yard, only males come out, and they're in effect sterile. You've got your own biocontrol system. Um, so that's the mosquito side, and we can do other species. But we can also move across into agriculture, which actually we've also been doing. Um, and in agriculture, again, um, it's a different control issue. You have some very effective products out there, but you've still got gaps. You've got pests which aren't well controlled by some chemicals. You've got periods of, of the growing season where you actually can't use uh, insecticides or pesticides, <laughs> um, particularly at the end uh, of pre-harvest. So we have several agricultural pests um, for horticulture coming through, and then also for broad acre. We're actually thinking now about corn pests, soya pests, sugar cane, that sort of thing. And again, any insect which sort of burrows in, it's very difficult for a chemical to get it. Um, this technology has worked very well. Animal houses, um, large areas where you have very high value uh, animal production, and you have um, insect pr problems, if you have to completely take all your animals out and um, effectively um, sanitize that area, it's very, very expensive. This technology, I think, would work very well. Um, and we're just starting our first um, animal health um, product. And then, of course, mosquitoes. We can't get away from mosquitoes, but malaria is a, a clear and obvious target. Malaria would be more difficult than dengue because you have more species that actually spread malaria. But I still think this is a perfectly tractable solution. Not in every case, but certainly in quite a lot of the, uh, the areas of the world, I think we can have a big impact. Um, I'd also add that I wouldn't see this as a silver bullet. This is another tool to be combined with, uh, with tools that already exist. Um, and you can imagine, uh, in some areas, you might want to do a knockdown with some kind of um, uh, chemical intervention and then use this to polish off the rest of the population. But that's um, very much what our plan is. We're bringing this forward at the moment. Um, this is a new technology. You have to get out on the street and talk to people. Um, so we do a lot of talking, actually. I'm not sure your boys completely bored of hearing me, but we do a lot of talking to people. Um, so we obviously do the normal scientific conferences, but we actually go out into the street, we talk to people, we do door-to-door, -door, we do town hall meetings, we do popular press. Um, we have not, in the last four or five years, as far as I know, refused a single interview by any member of the press. Um, we place no restrictions on the press in terms of what they can film. Um, and who they can interview. But we do say, this person's rather better on that topic, and this person's rather better on that topic, but quite frankly, we can talk to who you like. It's all about transparency, and it's about building confidence, and I think one of the ways we have to do that is actually by engaging as much as we can. We're a small company, and there's a limit to what we can do, and we can always do more. But engagement and direct engagement, I think, is absolutely critical. Um, that image down the right-hand side is quite an interesting one. Um, because the males are going by, actually, you can go out into the street with a cage of genetically engineered mosquitoes and say, would you like to put your hand in? And what do you find? You find a bit of a fluttering, um, but that's, that's it, you don't get bitten. And actually, it's a very powerful communication tool in some areas. So just coming to the end, the major challenge, actually, we have is in the GM label because there is a huge societal perception around GM, the use of GM, what it actually means. Now, I'm actually very much an advocate of using technology on a case-by-case -case basis where it's merited. Um, and I think if you have a population like ours of somewhere over 6 billion, forecasts are we're going to get to 9.5 billion by 2050. I've seen forecasts that say we need to expand our food production by 70% to cater for the move to more, more, to more animal protein. There is a huge challenge. And I think this sort of technology, in the form of crops and in other forms of technology, can play their part. None of these things are a single answer, but together we can advance a lot. But the GM label is a, is a misnamer, isn't it? Because actually, if you take a crop and you take an insect, they're very, very different. 
from a point of view of this technology and from the point of which or how they interact with nature. With a, a crop, you're actually putting a trait into the food plant itself. So you're actually putting a, um, a genetic construct into the food plant and then replicating it. With ours, you're actually not bothering with the food, you're going for the insect, you're going for the pest. Um, the, with a GM crop, you're, um, you're actually giving nature something advantageous, you're giving the plant something that it wishes to preserve, because it's giving it some kind of benefit, so it will actually perpetuate over time. What are you doing with a mosquito or a fruit fly? You're giving it the biggest single disadvantage it can have, which is the inability to reproduce. Again, a crop, you get neighbor, you get crops which are closely related, which can hybridize, so you can actually spread those advantageous genes. Um, in most cases, it's, it's to nil effect, actually, but you can still do it. Um, with mosquitoes and the fruit flies, they mate with their own species. They're not going to cross mate. You're not going to have that gene moving across. And monitoring. Monitoring is very important. How do you know where your trait has gone? How do you know where your genes have gone? Actually, that can be quite complicated. You can do PCR, of course, but you can't do it as a farmer. You can't do it on a regular basis. With ours, you have to colour. Um, so it's very simple monitoring. So actually, while I'm a supporter of both, they are very, very different, and I hope that's, I hope that's, I've made that case. Um, and that really comes back to this insect concept of GM. GM is not good, and GM is not bad. It's just a tool, it's just a technology. It's how it's applied that is important. And you need to look at um, efficacy, you look, need to look at safety, you need to look at the environment, judge the risks and the benefits. Case by case and on its merit. But actually so often at the moment, regulatory systems are built around not what it does, not what its attributes are, not how it's applied, but how it was built, how it was made, where it came from. It's quite a crazy situation. You could have exactly the same uh, phenotype arrived at from two different directions and one would be subject to much higher regulation than the other, even though they have all the same attributes. And this is a rather crazy system. And if we actually, if we need to feed the world and bring food for technology, we are going to have to address this and get a slightly more uh, intelligent way of dealing with it. But at the moment, we're putting a massive penalty around one area of technology, um, and it's important to, to address that. The third <coughs> final point, I would add a third bubble, actually. Um, and that's around control and the ability to prove you're in control. In other words, you're doing something, you are making a change, you are going to have an impact. But how do you know what impact you have and how can you control it? And in our case, um, I think we can control it quite well and actually we can see what we're doing because we have the, that fluorescence. I hope that's been interesting and um, I'll end there and I'd, be, I'd love to take questions. Thank you very much. We've had a very good attempt at coordination, um, and in some cases it's been quite comical, to the extent that you go to your public health authority who you're working with, and you say, our mosquitoes are susceptible to every type of pesticide that you can, insecticide you want to put out there, so shall we agree you're not going to spray on Thursday? And they go, absolutely agree, we'll spray on Monday and we'll spray on Friday. Fine, great, they will release our mosquitoes on Thursday. Release the mosquitoes, and there's a fogging truck going past, and they're all dying. So that is actually a, a nuisance, and it, it, right, it's a bit of an irritation. But, you know, our mosquitoes, they will die if they're um, anywhere near any conventional insecticide. Um, you would want to separate any treatments. Um, in actual fact, I think um, if you're going to use adulticides, you could certainly use adulticides in lockdown. We haven't done that purposefully. What we've tried to do is basically demonstrate our technology on its own. Otherwise, when you do a trial, um, people come to you and say, well, your result was due to using uh, chemicals. Where people have wanted to carry on using um, uh, insecticides, fogging or, um, or other methods, we've just made sure that the um, treatments they're using are the same as in the treated <coughs> control areas, so we still get a, a decent result. Um, but there are a number of different strategies. A knockdown, I think, has worked quite well, because actually, 
the delta signs are very good at hitting a large population and causing a sharp decline. And what we, we are very effective at is hitting a small population and taking it to zero. So the delta side first, followed by our technology, I think would work very well. But we haven't proven that as a, as a concept tool yet. What all we've done is actually mesh in our technology with existing practice. Um, but that's to come. We haven't seen it so far, uh, to be fair. Um, we have had this strain now since late 2002, so we've had well over 100 generations, um, which takes more generations actually than Dion Croxon had. We haven't seen any resistance. You could, you can theoretically get resistance. I think you can't rule it out. Um, what we have done is uh, made sure that we've not just got one trick up our sleeve, so we actually have two or three technologies. You've got different ways of actually affecting lethality. Um, so, for example, in the second generation, um, the second generation, the mode of action is completely separate. It actually, um, if you like, um, knocks out the effector muscles for the wing so that they can't fly. So they actually survive to adult stage, but they can't fly. They can't fly, they can't fight. So we haven't seen resistance. It could theoretically occur. We have a different mechanism. Regulators uh, vary around the world. Uh, some countries have um, regulations that can be fairly readily adapted. Um, uh, so Brazil, for example, um, that's been very successful. They, the way they are set up, uh, they can deal with this. The US, we spent a long time trying to find a regulator. And if you picture a poor man from Oxford or poor lady from Oxford wandering around regulators saying, Who's, who wants to be the regulator? And everybody goes, <coughs> that one over there. Um, quite difficult. Uh, eventually, the um, FDA decided to regulate it, and it's actually been regulated in the, in the US as an animal drug, which is slightly strange, but there we go. Slightly different system to Brazil. So, in a lot of countries, they have regulatory capacity, and we've been working with the WHO uh, TDR to do biosafety um, uh, training, less, um, training um, modules, if you like, to actually educate regulators, not only on our technology and some of the questions you'd ask, but also on other genetic strategies. And the WHO have now produced guidelines on how you would, and what sort of considerations you have for regulating um, genetically engineered insects. So there's both national initiatives and then there's sort of cross-national initiatives going on. But not every country, I mean, quite a lot of times we have um, an issue where a country says, I want to do this, the Minister of Health says, great, let's go ahead. And then they come back and say, sorry, we don't think we've got a regulatory capacity. Um, and we say, well, we can help you. And they go, we just don't think we've got it. We can't do it. Um, so we have to wait. Um, uh, society groups, huge difference around the world. Um, Generally speaking, in um, areas where you have already got a, an acceptance of genetically modified crops to an extent, you have an easier platform from which to start. Although, if you have a high awareness of GM crops, we need to spend a lot of time explaining why we're different, because it's a different concept. Um, but very, very good response in Brazil, throughout the whole of Brazil, um, very little um, negativism. If you take other areas, then again, I used to work with GM crops, so it, you know, it's quite an interesting contrast. What you see with GM crops is you get quite a broad alliance of pressure groups and NGOs opposing GM crops. You don't have that with us. What you actually have is the hardcore, the hardcore antis who are just not going to um, uh, accept anything. Um, so they're opposed to us. We don't tend to have the middle ground. Um, to give you an example, for an example, we have just finished a public comment period uh, before the USDA, um, United States Department of Agriculture, finished a comment period on um, the application on one of our pests, which will be um, brassicas. We had 270 <coughs> comments back, of which substantive comments were about 11 against and about 54, um, and the rest were just don't mess with nature and sort of general protest. Um, but if you're an agricultural company, a Monsanto or a Syngenta, and you put in a GM crop, 
we would expect that in the high, in, in the tens of thousands, that level of, of comment. Um, so you might say you're too small and you're under the radar, in which case um, that might be a false comparison. But generally speaking, it's a very different response to GM crops, I genuinely think. In Europe, um, well, yes, um, every sensible person I've ever spoken to says, for heaven's sake, don't go near Europe. <laughs> um, because Europe is not rational and the regulatory system is driven by politics with a bit of science as opposed to driven by science with a bit of politics. But still, let's have a go. So we have put an application in for olive fly. So in olives, um, most of the Mediterranean, a lot, large amount of Mediterranean communities are dependent on the olive. A lot of pesticides are being withdrawn. Farmers are not, haven't got control tools. We have the olive fly. Um, so we've actually applied for that. Very little negative press, actually. Um, quite interesting. Um, I expected an awful lot more. I, I, I expect we'll get more press as we go further through the process. So we're only at the front end. But I think, I think we gain by what we're trying to do. And I think we also gain, if I have to be absolutely candid, because we're a small company. Because a large amount of the protests in this area are linked to large corporates. And we're certainly nothing like a large corporate. Um, early days for Europe, I think. Thank you. Uh, we are very much like any living organism. We have our own survival uh, very close to our heart. Um, so basically our, our model would be that we would be responsible for production quality control. It's our insect, it's our brand, uh, we're responsible. The issue for, and I think from an affordability point of view, um, if you look at what people are doing and spending in the middle range countries, um, this is already affordable. The issue, I think, comes to the Cambodias and the Vietnams, the really you know, very poor countries, no GDP countries. So one of the concepts, and if you look at our model, what we tend to do, you've got two phases. You've got a, a phase where you suppress the population with a large number of mosquitoes, and then you maintain control. And the actual cost of that first year is much greater than the second and subsequent years. Um, now that's quite a commercial challenge. Um, I think it's per perfectly doable um, in the more developed countries. It's a big challenge for the um, developing countries because that first year is more than they would spend normally and then where do you get the cash from? So one of the concepts we've had, and we haven't developed it fully, is a development impact bond whereby, whereby you actually bring together a philanthropic funder who will actually bear the cost of that first year together with the recipient, if you like, the donor country, who says, fine, you pay for the first year, then I'll maintain the control thereafter on my own budget, and that's similar to what I'm already paying, and then us, of course, who supply the technology. Um, early days, we haven't seen one of those in practice, but that's, that's our sort of concept. In those cases, we would get our funding from the philanthropic funder in the first case, but we would actually do the work. We'd set up the factory, we'd produce the mosquitoes in the country. And then from that, from the first year, it would be from the funder, and from the subsequent years, it would be from the government or the municipality. <coughs> it depends where you are in the world, where the budgets are, and how it works. In small, some small countries, there will be one purchaser, which will be the Ministry of Health or the Ministry of Environment. And they're the ones who buy the insecticides and distribute them. But in the larger countries, it's uh, municipalities. So for example, in Brazil, each municipality itself actually has the budget for mosquito control. So each one of those is our customer in effect. Um, so it varies around the world, but whether we're using other companies to help distribute and monitor, or whether we're doing some kind of public-private partnership, our general philosophy is to maintain, us to maintain control of production, because that's actually our brand, that's our quality, and that's what we're paid for. Generally speaking, the position is as follows. Firstly, that this is a mosquito that's an invasive species in most countries. It came out of Egypt. It shouldn't be in Brazil to start with. It doesn't actually 
Um, it's not evenly spread around the country, very much concentrated in urban environments near humans. Now what happens at the moment is we humans spend our entire time trying to clobber this mosquito with insecticides. Effectively what we're doing is the same idea, but just with a biological control. Now if you take a town and you release our mosquitoes in the town, and even if you get that population down to zero, you're not actually going to have any effect on the surrounding area. So it is controllable. Now the one question, which I think is yours, is will another mosquito come in and take its place? Um, now the, one, the only one actually that people are concerned about is, another, is, a, is a related insect called Aedes albopictus. Sometimes we get it here in Europe and you, um, sometimes you see <coughs> Daily Mail articles in the summer the Asian tiger mosquito. Um, so that one is also an urban dweller, um, and that's the one that people, in our um, actual implementations, our post-approval monitoring, we need to demonstrate what happens to the Aedes albopictus population. But Aedes albopictus, or the Asian tiger mosquito, in, in itself is a very bad vector. So let's assume the worst. <coughs> let's assume you get rid of Aedes aegypti in an area, that's tremendous, and let's assume Asian tiger mosquito comes in, then actually you're replacing a very good vector with a very, um, it's very competent at spreading disease with one that's very bad. So you should, you're swapping mosquitoes, if you like, in the worst case, but actually you've reduced the disease threat considerably. Uh, and most of the public health authorities are not that worried about Asian tiger mosquito. Um, the other thing we're doing is we've got this technology in the Asian tiger mosquito because I think there will be cases where people will say, fine, we want, to, we want to get rid of the mosquito, and we understand that, but we also completely want to get rid of dengue, so can you get rid of the other vector, even though it's not as good? Um, so that's coming through as well. Thank you very much.